Here, I, I do research on a PhD on software security and with a special focus on web application security. And today I will talk about JavaScript malware. So, what actually is JavaScript malware? Just a short quick starter. Basically, JavaScript malware is a buzzword created by Jeremiah Grossman in late 2006. And this describes a whole class of browser based attacks that try to access and exploit internet resources. Um, there has been a lot of ongoing research since the age 2006, and I think we'll still see more results in the next couple of months. And what I think interesting about the stuff I will tell you about in the next 45 to 60 minutes is that if you look at the specs of HTML and HTTP and JavaScript and all everything that is related to that, none of the stuff I will tell you about violates these specifications. So all the techniques I will talk about are actually legal, but they are still, to some degree, a threat to internal networks. And therefore, we don't need browser bugs to do interesting stuff with the web browser. Uh, short agenda, uh, I have to talk a little bit about basics, uh, same audit policy and how to get around it, um, so that we are all on the same page. And then we have two large chapters in this talk, uh, internet attacks in general, and a special focus on DNS rebinding, or also known as anti-DNS pinning. Um, then uh, I take liberty and talk a little bit about uh, client-side protection, especially local rotor. This is a tool that uh, me and one of my students de uh, developed, and then a short conclusion. Okay, the basics. Uh, I think most of you will already know this uh, by heart, but anyway, the same audit policy is the one and only security policy that applies to web applications. There's nothing more, there's nothing less. It's not very sophisticated, but it is what it is. The same logic policy defines the uh, access rights between two entities, two documents loaded from the internet and displayed in your web browser. Two documents or two uh, active elements are allowed to interact with each other when the origin match. And the origin is defined by, let's see if I can work this. Oh no, I can't. There's, by the protocol, so for example, HTTP, by the domain, for example, example org, and by the port, usually port 80, but could be something different. If one of these three properties differ uh, in the URLs that uh, were used to get the content or that are uh, used to display the web page, then the same origin policy is not satisfied, and if it's not satisfied, then those elements can't interact. So the same origin policy basically defines a sandbox, and actually it's a pretty good sandbox if you look at it. Um, web application or web page doesn't have any access to the local file system because if you're from a web browser, you need the file com slash uh, port uh, protocol descriptor to get to the file system. So this is a violation of the uh, protocol rule. You have no direct access to other web applications because they're hosted on different domains. And you don't have any access to other uh, applications even if they're on the same server because they're run on different ports and use different protocols. So actually, this should be a sufficient good sandbox, one would think. But there is a tiny but effective loophole in the same origin policy. And this loophole comes because JavaScript was just an afterthought after creating HTML. And HTML is the hypertext markup language, and the hypertext is the defining uh, thing in HTML. Therefore, um, there are certain elements in HTML that reference uh, elements that are hosted on network locations. For example, images, host Im uh, reference images, and script, and iframe, and style. And if the web browser tries to render one of these elements, um, it creates an HTTP request. These, uh, the targets of these HTTP requests are not, <laughs> sorry, are not uh, restricted by the same origin policy. Um, for this reason, um, we can create uh, HTTP requests in this in this matter, to cross-domain hosts. But, let's see if this is on this browser. JavaScript can alter the HTML code of every web page it, uh, it can write to, and therefore it can create dynamically images, iframes, uh, style sheets on the run, and therefore is able to do indirect communication with cross-domain hosts using this technique. So uh, by including an image from example or uh, an attacker can create indirectly a communication to uh, attacker org from web page hosted on example org, for example. So, what does this mean? Um, 
The same origin policy should prevent cross-domain data retrieval, right? So what can we do with uh, this indirect communication? We can do something that I call the basic reconnaissance attack. The basic reconnaissance attack uh, has one purpose only. It allows the attacker to do a binary decision. Does the exist, does the element that I reference with the URL do exist or doesn't it exist? Um, the method is always the same. You can do uh, reconnaissance, reconnaissance in different elements. Um, the attacker constructs a URL U that points to a host or to an image or to whatever that he wants to try found if it exists. Then he starts in timeout event T, that is rather important. And then he uh, includes dynamically an element into the DOM tree that points to this external resource. And uh, he outfits this element with two event handlers, the onload handler and the on error handler. Now he has three indicators, the timeout, the on error, and the on load to find out what was the result of this inclusion process. And using this three, uh, the three event handlers, and depending on which element he tries to access and uh, which element he used for this recognize attack, he can deterministically conclude this host is up, this uh, web application is running here, and stuff like that. The, th the second thing to get around the same origin policy uh, using this technique is uh, getting partial write access to other domains, or not really write access, but doing state changing requests. This is a technique called uh, cross-site request forgery. It's rather underestimated, but people start getting that this is a problem. And yeah, cross-site request forgery has like a million names. It has been called session writing, it has been called uh, CSERF. Somebody now uh, just recently announced that he starts to call cross-site request forgery unauthorized uh, access, there are various different acronyms. But cross site request forgery actually is a rather easy attack. It takes implicit authentication. With implicit authentication, we denote all, um, attack or all authentication mechanisms that are executed by the browser without interaction with the user and without active involvement of the web application. So cookie-based authentication, HTTP-based authentication, um, client-side SSL, <coughs> NTLM authentication. They're all executed by the web browser without the web application uh, uh, doing anything. And also the user is not really doing anything. The, the cookies are just put into the request by the web browser. Cross-site request forgery attacks these implicit authentication mechanisms by hiddenly creating or stealthily creating HTTP requests to web applications. And these requests are outfitted by the browser with the necessary authentication credentials. A really short quest, uh, example. So we have a banking application at bank.com and the user authenticates himself because he wants to do some online banking and after he did uh, uh, the, the authentication, he has the authentication cookie. And then he does some online banking and then, oh, he receives an email and somebody tells him, hey, you should look at this. This is the most cute cat you have ever seen and he's an internet user so he's totally into cats. So he looks at the cat picture and the cat picture is really, really cute. And, but what does he doesn't know is that the cat has a little sibling. The sibling is an invisible image and the image has a URL that points to his bank. And as he's still authenticated with his bank, the image, the hidden image, is able to reference a, a state-changing URL of his bank and the URL, because this bank was really careless, was able to, is uh, doing some transferring money a certain amount to a certain account. And as the user is still authenticated, then the cookie is automatically put to this request uh, by the web browser, this might even succeed if the bank is really stupid. So banks are not that stupid, but other applications are. There are some really, there were some really serious uh, exploits in this direction. Okay, so much about the basics. Let, let's see. How can you use these basics and these uh, basic attacks I talked about in the internet context? So I talked about implicit authentication. And if you look at your firewall and if you look at your internet web servers, then you will conclude that the firewall actually is a mean of implicit authentication. Every web browser that is inside the internet is implicitly allowed to access the internet web servers. Every web browser is outside of the internet. The firewall denies the access. So if the firewall is a mean of implicit authentication, it is susceptible or susceptible to cross-site request forgery attacks, isn't it? So in this, we have the malicious host that's outside the firewall, and we have the web browser that's inside the firewall. 
by looking at the cat picture, the user that is inside the intranet implicitly allows the attacker to access internal resources by cross-site request forgery. Okay, so put it together. We allow a JavaScript execution inside the internet, and JavaScript can do, do the basic reconnaissance attack, and it can do uh, some exploiting using uh, cross request forgery. So this is not too good, is it? Okay, just uh, to um, a little bit strengthen my point, uh, the basic reconnaissance attack now in the realm of the intranet. Um, for example, in this case, the attacker wants to know if at the IP 10.10.10.10 uh, that he somehow knows this part of the intranet is hosted a web server, he includes and dynamically an image into the source of the web page with the cat, and, and depending on which event it uh, triggers, if there's an onload event or an on error event, then he knows the, the host somehow answered, maybe with HTML data, maybe with an RST package. If there's a timeout event, then he knows, okay, the, the event has, uh, the request has timeout, and therefore he knows either the URL exists or the host exists or it doesn't. But it doesn't really matter, does it? Because uh, all the, you use some obscure private IP that can't be found, uh, IP space that can't be found out because you are behind a uh, net. Um, that's Java. And if your browser is allowed uh, your users, uh, to use Java, then you have a small problem because um, Java has sockets. JavaScript doesn't have sockets, doesn't know about IPs, Java does. Uh, because Java has a little bit different, same origin policy. And um, the socket object is not only uh, settable, it's also, also readable. While B, the communication is still restricted to direct communication, attack or org, the attacker is not really interested in uh, the target of the communication. He knows which IP attack or org has. He's interested in the source of the, of the communication. And therefore he creates a socket communication and looks at the local address of the host address. And this is the IP address of the local browser. So. Um, Therefore, uh, on modern browsers like Firefox and uh, Opera, it's even possible without starting an applet by using Live Connect that uh, allows JavaScript to create dynamically or instantiate dynamically Java objects. Good, so now the attacker is able to find out the IP address and he's able to do a, a series of basic reconnaissance attacks. So now he can go through the internet through the IP space looking for internet web servers. Um, I don't go into much detail now uh, because there are subtle differences on which event to use with which uh, elements. So with iframes you don't get on errors but you get better fingerprinting of a service and stuff like that. Um, I think if you're really into that, you can look it up in the internet. Uh, these slides have a rather, a rather, this end. Okay. rather large uh, a reference section, but I have a small demo to prove my point. So this is hosted on my server at database.net, and this is a really dirty hack, and you can look at the code, but uh, you can do it better, I, think, I guess. I just wrote it yesterday because I thought maybe it's interesting. Also, maybe I can't even access it because uh, my internet is not working. What do you say? That would suck. So I have an IP. Okay, we wait one more minute, then I go on with the presentation. Maybe one of the organization staff can get me uh, cable internet or cable-based internet, not uh, airport internet. Okay, never mind. Let's go back to the presentation. Maybe you can look at the demo uh, at the Q&A, or maybe not. So we can do, when the attacker knows which IPs, which local IPs host uh, internet web servers, he can do even more. He can try to do, find out what servers there are. So if, if it's Apache or Internet Information Server, he can try to find out if it's maybe a home router that is doing some interest, uh, that is doing uh, uh, some work on this uh, network. Or if there is an internet server, maybe he can find, uh, he wants to know if there's a media wiki or WordPress or Scroll mail. Depends on which one has the best uh, possibility of exploiting. This can all be done with the basic reconnaissance attack again 